Hey, welcome to another exciting episode of Communication Steroids, the podcast. Is it an episode? Is this an ongoing thing, Roger? <laughs> well, I feel somewhat episodic, so I guess so, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, my name's Tim Gordon. And, and I'm Roger Pike. Yeah, i, I got to throw that in there, man. People have got to know who I am. Of course they do, knowing you. <laughs> so we have some interesting things to chat about today, and when you brought the idea over, I thought, what a great idea, because I've actually uh, wrote an article on this very concept, but not to the extent that you were talking about, and that is written language versus writing for the ear. Yeah, it was either that or how to write a Christmas toast, and this one. <laughs> We've done the Christmas toasting before. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, the idea is that uh, writing for the eye, is uh, writing to be read, is very different than writing a speech to be heard or other communication to be heard. And it's more than just the fact that the listener or the, or the, the viewer or the reader uses his eyes instead of his ears. There's a difference in the way that we perceive things when we read them as the, as the way that we perceive them when we hear them. And an effective communicator acknowledges that differences, difference and even embraces it and changes his, write, his or her writing and speaking style to encompass the fact that the eye and the ear are, are different organs. Not everyone does that. Now, there are some writers that write in, it's, it's like they're talking, like they talked their book and someone just wrote it verbatim down what they said, like, uh -huh. hey, y'all, how are you doing today? You know, it's a great day here in southern Alabama or whatever the case may be. And you look at them, there's slang in there, there's y'all. And, and I've seen that in the written language. And there's always, depending on the context, sometimes it's okay if it's like a part of a story. Right. But if... If it's part of a shtick. I mean, if, yeah. I mean I, I've seen stories that have been written in a, in a stream of consciousness manner, and that was the point, was to write it in the stream of consciousness But in manner. some ways it makes you a little uncomfortable. Like you think, well, can't they write? They're missing something. Uh, you, you, you feel like you're missing part of the communication. Exactly. But here's the rule of thumb. Uh, the rule of thumb is that things that are written can be more formal. Things that are heard or are written for the ear that are, that are spoken should be more conversational. And that's just the way things are. For the ear, uh, be more conversational. For the eye, you can be a little stuffier. You should use language appropriately right. uh, for both the ear and the eye. You know that. Uh, for example, and of course, everything depends on your audience. If you're talking to a bunch of nuclear physicists about nuclear physics, you can use very physicky uh, language. That would just, never happen to you and I. Of I course, just made but... that up because I didn't know what else to, to well, other way to, to describe it. No, we're not going to be giving speeches to nuclear physicists anytime soon. But uh, the rule of thumb is is that when you're giving a speech, you want to keep the language basically at a fifth or a sixth grade level. Uh, I know that having done the news on the radio for years and years and years and years and years, uh, you'd get in trouble from the, from the news director or the program director. And when I was the news director, you'd get in trouble for me if you'd lose, use language that was beyond much beyond that. You know, I got a, a call from a program director once because in a story I'd used the word chasm, and he thought that that was just uh, too... Uh, it was like an eighth grade word. It was an eighth grade word. So <laughs> Not a fifth grade I, word. And I shouldn't have used it. But that's the point. I mean, once you have spoken something, it's in the ether, it's out there, it can't be recovered, it can't be reread. So you want to make sure it's understood the first time. So you want to make sure that you use a language that, that can be understood the first time. Now, when, it's, when it's on the page, uh, for example, a newspaper, they want you to use a you know, third through fifth grade education, but that's a little different matter. When it's on the printed page, it can be a little stuffier because if people don't understand it the first time, they can go back and reread it if they want to, or they can even get out the dictionary and look it up. Uh, but you can't do that uh, uh, so much on the spoken word, and it, that's why you want to make sure that your language is appropriate to the, the, the thing that you're doing. And, and not only that, you have more uh, time to actually process. If you, I mean, if you're writing something, you can go over it and edit it a number of times, uh, certainly if you can do the same thing if you're writing for the ear, but if you're just on the radio and you're talking mm -hmm. and you start using all those highfalutin words like like chasm, for instance. Like chasm, for example, yeah. <laughs> uh, some people might go, what did he just say? Uh -huh. And they might feel like, oh, they lost something right there. Well, and there are there are things that people just feel comfortable with with the with, with the eye that they feel less comfortable with with the ear or even will object to. And one example that, that, uh, that I've always discussed and that, that, that my trainers have always talked to me about is the use of contractions. Right. Uh, uh, when you write, you can say, he cannot meet the deadline. And people will read that as he can't. Or they won't even, they, they won't even uh, think about it. They'll they'll just, just, yeah, they'll just it, process it. it. They'll just process it. Sure. But when you say, he cannot meet the deadline, in a, the spoken form, unless you're really trying to emphasize that he can't meet it. Or your commander data. Or, <laughs> or Johnny Carson. <laughs> they, they consider you stuffy or arrogant or rude or pretentious. 
You use contractions when you're in your smoking communication. He can't meet the deadline, man. He just can't. I don't, you know, do I don't it. think I ever heard Johnny Carson use a contraction. He would always say, "I did not know that." I did not know that. It was part of his shtick, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I just wouldn't have been wouldn't have been the same if he'd looked at Ed and said, "I didn't know that." I remember when I first got into radio at 19, 20 years old. Uh, one of the guys that taught me how to write copy said, "You know, speak in phrases. You can do that." Uh, you don't have to always do that, but but write in phrases. You know, use a lot of what they call ellipses. I guess the, the mm-hmm. dot dot dot. So right. that gives the person that's reading the copy a chance to pause, but not necessarily stop and start a complete new sentence. Well, that was certainly a point that we should get to, and that is, is that when you write for the for the I, you should be grammatically correct. Yes, and you should use proper punctuation. Uh, and you just should. But in the ear, you can use incomplete sentences. You can you can use sentence fragments. Uh, you can use slang. You can use slang. Yeah, uh, anything vernacular, that's conversational, sure. anything yeah. that will make your listener feel comfortable that they can process easily. Plus, you don't need contractions at all because they're not going to see them, and you know what you're trying. Your meaning is. You don't have to to add to your meaning by using it. For example, when I'm writing speeches for myself that I'm going to give or verbal communications of any kind. I use punctuation primarily to indicate pausing, type of pausing and length of pausing. A comma is a short pause, a period is a long pause, and an ellipsis is a really long pause. Uh, a semicolon and a colon or a pause uh, in which I'm, I'm trying to tie two things together. It's sort of like a pregnant pause. A they're pregnant they're pause, waiting for exactly. something to be delivered. Exactly. Uh, and, that's, and that's how I, exactly. And that's how I use punctuation mm-hmm. as cues to myself about delivery. But if you looked at a piece of copy that someone's going to read in a radio or TV commercial or as a voiceover, it's going to look different. It's going to have all that stuff in there that is not what you would normally read. But it's, that's not meant to be read. It's meant to be heard. And so when you're judging that, read it, record it, listen to it back. And you'll hear a difference. And, and read something from the newspaper. It sounds like it's written for the newspaper. It doesn't sound like it should be yeah, read, read. It, read it aloud, but instead of just reading it, because you're also processing things visually when you read them, read it into a tape recorder. Yeah. And then play it back it's, to see how it sounds. And if you get a g- really good piece of well-written radio copy and read that out loud, boy, you'll really notice the difference. Massive difference. In fact... As a news director, uh, one of the worst things that could happen to me is to somebody would hand me copy that they'd ripped directly from the wire. Yeah. <laughs> we call them rip and read. Rip and read. And it's, 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 it's not rewritten for the eye, and it just doesn't work. So that kind of about wraps it up as far as I'm concerned. And I want to wish you a happy new year, Roger. Have a great 2008. Look forward to a lot of stuff here on communicationsteroids. Dot com, the podcast. Absolutely. Same to you and same to all of our podcast listeners. I hope that the new year, the Christmas finds you happy and healthy and that the new year brings you wonderful stuff. And you as well. I'm Tim Gordon, and that was Roger Pike on our podcast from communicationsteroids.com.